Sam De Stefano was an Italian American mobster prolific in the 50s and 60s who picked up the name Mad Sam for his unhinged lunacy. Now, I'm not exactly the most tasteful commentator out there, but I do try to avoid being gratuitous, or when I'm sober at least. But this episode will be by far the most graphic and disturbing telling that I've done to date, and that's just purely to illustrate just how deranged Mad Sam was. Born in 1909, Sam De Stefano grew up in Chicago, the son of two Italian immigrants. It's already foreboding those bloody Italian Americans causing trouble the whole time. Not like us Irish, they loved us over there. Sam got involved in crime at a young age, associating with the 42 gang in his teens. The 42 gang was a street gang of youngsters who would often graduate into the outfit Al Capone Chicago based mafia. De Stefano first went to jail at the age of 17 for the crime of rape. Following a 17-year-old girl home from a cinema showing, De Stefano and fellow gang members abducted the girl and brought her to a garage where she was sexually assaulted by seven men. He only received three years in prison for this because the police arrived before he had the chance to rape her. When he got out, De Stefano got involved in bootlegging, gambling and robberies. In 1933, Sam was caught escaping a bank robbery when the getaway car broke down. And this was the early 30s, the cars ran on dinosaur farts and steadfast prayer. They broke down as easily as a Protestant's kneecaps. Sam was sentenced to 40 years in prison for this. I would have said the first conviction was for a far more heinous crime, but there you go. He got out after 10 years, but was back again in 1947 for counterfeiting wartime ration stamps. At this point, Sam had spent nearly half his life in prison, just like me when I play Monopoly. During his time behind bars, De Stefano was making connections with the mob. One of those he met with was Paul Rica, the acting boss of the outfit, who took Sam under his wing and taught him about racketeering. Rica was so impressed by the fearless De Stefano that he gave him a role as a loan shark for the outfit. When De Stefano was released, he was given a sum of money to begin juice loaning with the understanding the mob would see a profit. Juice loaning is a practice where money is lended to an individual outside the law. Because the money cannot be regained legally, the creditor must use other ways of extracting the money. This is where Sam started to come into his own. He was good at juice loaning, like really, really good. He had a violent side that made him an excellent enforcer for loaning. Through loan sharking, he advanced in the criminal world to the point where he had people working under him as his collectors. He soon had a little crew, including his two brothers, Michael and Mario, his protege, Tony the Ant Spilatro, and Charles Grimaldi. By the early 60s, so great was his influence that politicians, lawyers, and policemen were among his debtors. Because of this, De Stefano had enough power over the law to influence the outcomes of court cases. This became another stream of revenue for him, selling criminals an effective get-out-of-jail-free card. I really could have done but more of those in Monopoly. De Stefano's effectiveness as a loan shark lay with his ruthlessness. He was violent to the point of sadism, going so far as to torture his victims. Charging 20 to 25% interest per week, he would knowingly accept high-risk loans because he enjoyed torturing and murdering those who defaulted. This is how he started to become known as Mad Sam. One of his victims, a local restaurant owner, had been late on his juice loan, so he was brought into Sam's basement to be tortured. Sam had a number of tools to prolong his victim's suffering, but his favourite was the ice pick, with which he would stab you in the throat, the ears, the testicles, and anywhere else. The restaurant owner eventually gave out of a heart attack and his body was later found in the sewer. At some point, something was becoming clear. Sam and his brother Mario were cut from the same cloth. Brother Michael, however, was not quite as brutal. He never had the makings of a varsity athlete. He became addicted to drugs, which were prohibited for members of the outfit due to the attention they brought from the feds. FBI, open up! Eventually, the order came down from the top. Michael had to go. He was shot to death by his own blood. Mario and Sam both. This is where FBI agent William Romer enters the fray. A lot of what we know about Mad Sam's behaviour comes from Romer's personal dealings with him. Romer regarded Sam as one of the worst torture murderers in the history of the US. But he wasn't just sadistic, he was an eccentric loony. When Romer called about the murdered restaurant owner, De Stefano met him in his pyjamas with the front open so as to expose himself. After posturing for a while, Agent Romer lost his temper and accused Sam of the murder. This threw Sam into a rambling fit of rage, which would become a staple of his bizarre behaviour. He shouted for his wife and kids to enter the room and called upon God to curse them all with cancer if he truly was the killer. Many, many parallels here to my Monopoly experiences. In his visits to the De Stefano household, Sam's wife would serve Agent Romer coffee, which Romer would later learn Sam had pissed in. Surely he would have noticed the distinct Coors Light flavour. 
In another bizarre and disturbing incident, a civilian reported to the police that he had been abducted by Sam and taken to his home, where he was forced to rape Sam's wife at gunpoint. This was in revenge for her somehow angering or annoying Sam. Romer also had dealings with one of Mad Sam's most feared collectors, William Action Jackson, a lumbering beast of a man at £300. The FBI believed it may have been able to flip the simple-minded brute into informing. Romer alleges Jackson refused to turn his clock, but nevertheless, the rumor spread. Believing Jackson had become a rat, Mad Sam and his henchmen lured Jackson to a meat packing plant. He was stripped naked, hung on a meat hook by his rectum, and broken up with bats, stabbed with an ice pick, zapped with a cattle prod, and burnt with a blowtorch. The torture lasted three days before Jackson died. Although he was one of the leading loan sharks for the outfit, Sam was seen as too unstable to formally induct into the Mafia, unlike his brother Mario, who was a made guy. His associate Charles Grimaldi would turn his back on the outfit and become an informer, giving us more insight into the mob's relationship with Sam. He alleged everyone regarded Sam as psychotic and unpredictable. He even claimed Sam worshipped Satan and would go into uncontrollable fits where it seemed as if he was speaking to the devil. The outfit's patience with Mad Sam was starting to run out. In 1972, Sam, Mario and Tony Spilatro would be charged with the torture murder of one of Sam's collectors a decade earlier. Grimaldi gave evidence explaining how the collector got into a heated argument with Sam and was later lured to De Stefano's basement under the pretense that all was forgiven. Here, Grimaldi, Spilatro and the De Stefano brothers tortured and murdered him. And I mean, going down into the basement with a torture murderer, come on. At this point in his life, Sam was no stranger to the courtroom. He would often draw media attention in his cases by representing himself and showcasing his bizarre behaviour. This case was no different, with De Stefano being wheeled in on a gurney in his pyjamas, rambling nonsensically, shouting at the judge and jury using a bullhorn. He would be thrown out and held in contempt of court on numerous occasions. The problem with drawing so much media attention is twofold. First is the obvious fact that there are elements in the organization that the Mafia would rather be left in the dark away from prying eyes. The second is it is harder for the outfit to fix a case that is making headlines. You can't as easily bribe the authorities and sweep everything under the rug, but so many people are watching. By being mad, Sam was not only jeopardizing his own case, but Mario's and Spilatro's too. But this was just another facet of Mad Sam's deranged nature. He couldn't have the money-making businessman and a well-adjusted human being. His crazy antics were just a shitty part of the full package, similar to dating a single mother. Even with the money he was bringing in, the mobsters were finding it harder and harder to tolerate the package deal that was Mad Sam. And just like a single mother, they decided it was a pretty crappy deal. Mario, Sam and Tony Spilatro were all acquitted of the collector's murder, but as soon as they were released, the order came in. If Sam wasn't going to prison, he had to be taken care of another way. In the mob, orders to kill a member are often given to those closest to him, a person he trusted. Being his brother, Mario De Stefano was chosen to orchestrate the hit on Sam. This would make the second brother he'd have to kill. Touch me, but don't touch my brother. I don't like it when you touch my brother. Don't look cross-eyed at my brother. Then I became what they call a raving maniac. Do I make myself clear? Abuse me, do what you want, slap me in the face and I won't say nothing. But don't you pick on my family. On April 14th, 1973, Sam received word that the location of the rat, Charles Grimaldi, had been discovered. Having previously been his underling, Grimaldi had been threatened by Sam during the trial. Mario De Stefano and Tony Spilatro made their way over to Sam's place to discuss the plan to get Grimaldi for testifying against them. They pulled up into Sam's garage. Mario exited the car first and stood in front of Sam. When he stepped aside, Spilatro had a shotgun aimed at Sam. He fired two shots, the first blowing off Sam's arm, the second hitting him in the chest, killing him. The murder was never brought to trial. And that concludes the tale of Mad Sam. The Mafia sure is an interesting subject, perhaps I'll revisit it someday. Who knows, we may even come across some of these characters again. Let me know if you'd like me to explore the topic more, or if you have any other cool topics for a video. I have quite a backlog of ideas I've robbed from you guys in the comments. 
If there's anything you'd like to suggest or you just want to keep up with me, I have a Twitter account now that you can follow. And if you're more of a silent lurker but still want to show your support for the channel, I have a merch store where I sell t-shirts based on my videos. Alright, now that I'm done plugging my shit, I can leave for another few months. Have I done anything or frighten you? They claim I frighten everybody. Why? I'm now 63 years old. I couldn't whip a 10-year-old boy. But uh, have any of you at any time been frightened of me?